Hi, Bonnie. I wish I could hug you. <laughs> BJ, Bonnie says hi. Hey, Bonnie. I'm going to turn my chat off, so I'll let you, I'll let you uh, monitor away. Okay. All right. So, um, hi, everybody. My name is Jacqueline, and I am one of the hosts um, for this weekend's event. Um, I hosted a couple of events or things this morning, so maybe you saw me there. Um, otherwise, thanks for joining us. Um, this session is going to be with my friend, BJ. Uh, BJ is a former chairperson of HDO and an instrumental part in the founding of HDO. Um, we are so thankful to have you here and I'm excited to hear you speak once again. So take it away, BJ. Thanks, Jackie. Hey, everybody. Uh, I, I told this to Jackie earlier, but uh, I had a, a babysitter fall through. So I have a, a one-year-old right next to me who uh, really doesn't care about this talk. So he's uh, he may uh, scream and shout and bang around, but I have some some toys and some food to distract them. And uh, if need be, Jackie's gonna come on and, and give some, some HDO commercials if I have to run. But uh, thanks for joining everybody. Thanks for um, taking the time to participate in, in not just the Congress, but the session too. Uh, excited to talk to you and share a little bit about my Huntington's journey, which is what Matt and team asked me to do and, and talk about. And you know, as Jackie said, uh, co-founder, former board chairman of the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization. After 10 years of being a volunteer, I stepped away last summer. Uh, but really what I want to emphasize is forever an HD advocate. So I'm going to talk about my story really in four different parts, starting from 1995 when I first learned about Huntington's and my family and uh, until today. Um, but going back to this 1995, this is my you know really kind of quick summary. I'm going to try to do it in three minutes with a few bullet points, uh, talking about how HD came into my life, how it impacted my life and, and where it got me to where I am today. But my mom, she was tested and di diagnosed in, in 1995. Um, tough day, like many of you know, learning about HD in your life or your parents' life. I was, I think, eight or nine years old at the time. Uh, I had a sister two years older than me. Uh, the one thing my parents did do, even though it was really hard, they, they came home and they told my sister and I, you know, they didn't know everything about HD at the time. They didn't tell my sister and I that they knew everything about HD. Um, but the couple things they left us with was, you know, mom is going to get sick. She's going to get sicker. Uh, we don't have all the answers, but if you have questions, you got to ask us and we'll find the answers for you. And then number three is they loved us. You know, they, they didn't want us to forget that, you know, whatever this news meant, you know, their love for us hadn't changed. So the one thing that my mom did, and I've said this a lot in many talks I've given, is, is she decided not to hide from HD. And from the get-go, she got involved. So she got involved with our local HDSA chapters uh, as a volunteer and, and being an advocate. And uh, really from there, my parents started taking us to family HDSA events, from education days to support groups to fundraisers, uh, allowing us the chance to slowly make Huntington's just kind of a normal part of our life. And I didn't really know what that was going to do for me. Uh, at the time, but I'm incredibly grateful for my parents to just bring us there and, and, and make it such a normal experience for us. Uh, my mom, she started developing symptoms. I think she was in her later 30s at the time. And uh, we had some ugly years, you know, growing up in a household with, with HD, there was depression, there was anxiety, there was suicide attempts on my mom. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was tough, it was, it was day to day. And, um, you know, those were some times I, I think I've blocked out many of those memories, but, um, but we knew it was coming. And in 2007, my sister and I were off in college. My dad was a, you know, the kind of the sole caregiver along with some other help we had, but we had to put my mom into a group home. Um, hopefully that's not too loud for you guys. That was a tough time too. Uh, moving my mom away out of our house, it was it was a kind of reality that this could be the kind of the last the last chapter in her life. And and what do we do with that? Uh, not just that, but it was kind of starting to be a time in my life when I was starting to think about myself being at risk. I was over the age of eighteen. You know, I was thinking about my future. I was in college, thinking about my career, and a lot of fear and anxiety on my part as well. 2011, um, 10 years, uh, next week, it'll be my mom, you know, peacefully passed away from Huntington's, uh, you know, she fought like hell and, you know, she lived every day to the fullest and I have no regrets. And I don't think she has any regrets, but 
uh, tough to see her go. Um, and this is obviously a picture of her on the bottom right of the screen. Uh, but she keeps me going. And uh, after my mom passed, uh, my sister and I both went under, both underwent genetic testing. And, uh, you know, luckily, and, you know, very, very blessed that uh, we both uh, tested negative. So that's kind of my HD story, real quick, um, personally. But uh, along those times, what we ended up doing as a family is, is kind of got involved in a different way. And this is the story of the Twin Cities Hoopathon. I'm from Minnesota uh, in the United States. We attended our first HDSA Hoopathon. It was a basketball free throw shooting event. Um, we didn't start the event. We just attended it. Some other volunteers put it on in 1995. And we left this event like excited. We're like, why don't we do something like this? And that was the question I asked my dad is, how do we hold our own fundraising event? And uh, we didn't know anything about fundraising. We had never held a fundraiser. We were still pretty new to Huntington's in general. But, um, you know, my dad said, yeah, let's, let's go for it. So in 1996, we held our first event. Again, we told our friends, we told our families, we told our, our neighbors, and we had 50 people come to a gym. We shot some baskets and uh, we walked away raising $2,000. And we were elated. We were like, we just, we felt like we just found a cure for Huntington's because we felt like we, we were fighting back. We were doing something. We were showing our mom that we were going to stand by her side and HD wasn't going to beat us down. And even though it was just $2,000, like it, it, it felt like so much more. So every year after that, uh, we held the event again for 15 years. And what we did was every year we tried to just improve, improve the experience. Um, add things that, that we didn't have before, take away things that didn't work, uh, uh, improve things that, that, um, that people seem to enjoy. And over the years, we helped raise you know, over a million dollars. And the one thing I want to emphasize is this was in a time when social media, really the internet wasn't even uh, too big of a thing to advertise. So the main way we raised money was we knocked on doors. You know, we were middle school kids. We'd go out with our pens and paper and our folders and our flyers, and we would knock on neighborhoods doors for hours at a time in the winter of Minnesota. And we would educate every single person about Huntington's, about the Hoopathon. And at the end, we would just ask them for money. And, uh, you know, it's, it's such a different time in our culture these days, but people would give us $20 bills, $50 bills. They would write checks, if you remember what checks were. And uh, we would stash them in our envelopes. And, and really, that's how we raised so much money. And uh, it was also a way for us to spread the awareness. So uh, the Hoopathon was an amazing experience. It really catapulted me into the next slide, which I'll talk about, which, which connected me with so much more in the HD community. But it wasn't just about raising money either. Uh, we encouraged other families, especially in our local area, that they had the ability and the power to hold their own fundraising events. You know, the View family had nothing special to them. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we put our best foot forward and our best efforts. And, you know, this is what happened. And, and people started hosting their own events. And not just that, but families who came to the Hoopathon, they weren't connected to the HD community. So we got to connect them to the center of excellence, the social worker support groups, and other resources that they may never have if they didn't hear a, you know, a Hoopathon um, advertisement on, on the radio. So I'll, I'll show this clip real quick. I don't know if sound's going to work. So maybe somebody jump in if you don't hear the sound, but this was one of the, uh, the videos we shot of the Hoopathon just to give you a, a taste of what it is. Um, this was probably 10 years ago, I think, but it was one of the last events we held. All right, we're here at the Twin Cities Hoopathon, which is the largest free throw shooting competition for individuals and teams in the Twin Cities, uh, all going to support Huntington's Disease Society of America. All right, so you get the point of what the Hoopathon was. So anyway, a lot of fun digging through uh, some video archives. 
and uh, and watching those and putting the slides these slides together. But uh, big encouragement, really, to anybody. If if you want to hold an event like that, you know, you don't need any skills. You just gotta you know put your put your mind to it, put your foot down, and, and get it on paper. Invite your friends, invite your family, and and have a good time doing it. Um, so really, that that third chapter of my uh, HD story, becoming an HD advocate, really came after the hoopathons were over after I graduated from college. And, and I call this kind of uh, time turning my passion into a profession. So I was invited in 2009 to publicly speak about living at risk and holding these hoopathons. And uh, it was a HD World Congress in Vancouver. And, and really two major, major life events happened for me in Vancouver is number one, um, after my talk, I, I put my business cards under every chair in the auditorium. And uh, one of the people who picked up my business cards were folks who worked at this Lundbeck Pharmaceuticals. And Lundbeck had just brought to market in the United States the first ever treatment for Korea, uh, the involuntary movements associated with HD. And uh, they invited me to join their, their marketing team and advocacy team when I was right out of high school, so, or right out of college. So uh, that became my profession, my, uh, you know, my nine to five job that was paying me, but also allowing me to, to really put my passion into my work and uh, you know, work with the Huntington's community. So I spent six years uh, on marketing and, uh, marketing and advocacy while also um, going out and knocking on doors of doctors who treated people with Huntington's disease. So from big centers of excellences to random cities where you know, individual doctors see one HD patient, it was an opportunity for me to talk to them about HD, educate them about a medicine, uh, talk to them about all the other resources that were available to families. And it was just a great experience. The second piece that came out of Vancouver uh, Congress was I met a handful of young people, including Matt Allison, who you talked or you heard from uh, uh, earlier today, the founder of HDO. And uh, Matt and I talked uh, for quite a bit. I think it was over Facebook Messenger at the time. That was the only way to communicate with people across the world. And we figured out a way to combine our forces. And there was a handful of others, shout out to, to Kat Martin, Bryn Stansby, who uh, were instrumental at the time. Uh, you know, Matt, as he talked about earlier in his, his talk today, that the amount of time he put in, uh, it was really a group effort. And uh, without all the folks that Matt mentioned coming together, HDO wouldn't be here. So from that point on, I took on the HDO board chairman role. It's a volunteer role, but I really focused a lot of my time and efforts into launching HDO USA, which is its own 501c3 nonprofit organization here in the United States. And uh, I kind of became an advocate for young people across the globe. I learned about all the other you know, problems that, that others were facing that I faced, and I wanted to put a solution to it. And, and Matt and his idea of HDO was that perfect solution. So building HDO, I'm going to get a little bit of my soapbox here, but I just want to explain to you a little bit where I don't think Matt kind of touched on this, but it's easier for me to do from my lens and also not being officially a part of HDO anymore. But, but a couple of things people don't necessarily know is, is nonprofits and HDO specifically, they don't appear overnight. Um, you know, money, resources, it doesn't just show up at your doorstep. You know, conferences like this, HDO's camps, they don't just happen. Uh, it takes a whole lot of selfless sacrifice of time, resources, and passion from many, many people around the world. So my encouragement is, why not you? Um, that's one thing for you to think about. But this top picture on the left, this is, this is Matt and I running a marathon, raising money for HDO, I think before HDO was even started. And uh, I think Matt ran 20 marathons that summer raising funds. I joined him for one, um, and that was plenty for me. And uh, in this picture here on the top left, right, this is really, uh, I think the time, forget where it was, but Matt presented the idea of HDO to a handful of young people. And this is us sitting around a circle uh, talking uh, for lengths at time, uh, what HDO could be, what it could do. And um, it, this, is, this is kind of the, the early stages. It's, it's not always been this booth with t-shirts and a logo and, and bracelets and all these volunteers. It's taken a lot of, lot of time and energy. And, and that's a credit to so many folks around the globe who, who um, dedicated their time and efforts. So uh, HDO, again, it's a nonprofit, but, but nonprofits, they're businesses. And businesses are not easy to create, not easy to manage, not easy to operate, especially on an international scale. So without financial support from people like yourselves, people like the pharmaceutical industry, like donors, you know, HDO wouldn't exist. And, and it really, it won't exist into the future if we all don't 
contribute just a little bit to that pie to keep this organization alive. So I encourage you to think about when you are making donations, think of HDO. Um, and much of the programs that HDO puts on, the projects, they don't come to life without the help of volunteers. You heard Matt talk a little bit today. HDO has one full-time staff. So if you have the ability to help out, you know, why not you? Why aren't you involved in this organization today or your own HD organization, your own country? Um, and then all nonprofits, they have board of directors, you know, boards oversee what happens uh, at a nonprofit and, and the board members, they're volunteers and they have specific skills. But my, my question to many of you is, do you have specific skills to join a board like HDO? Because HDO, you always need new blood in nonprofits. So please, just if you have the opportunity, uh, you can volunteer, you can be a board member, you can make a donation, you can hold a fundraiser, you know, please think of HDO. They need everybody's help. This is a slide, again, Matt talked a lot about this, but this is some crazy amount of success uh, that HDO has had over the last 10 years. Um, you know, since launching in 2012, we've raised over $1.5 million. 550 people have gone to an HDO camp that's been held around the world. Uh, HDO land or, and the website has been viewed 7 million times. Uh, HDO has a YouTube channel. I hope you guys have been to it. It's got an amazing library of videos. I checked today. It, it says a million on this, on this stat, but it's actually 2.7 million views of videos that HDO has created. That is an amazing impact for an organization just 10 years old. So um, just my hats off to everyone who's dedicated a second, a minute, an hour, a day of their time uh, to, to help bring HCO to where it is today. And again, it's going to take all of us to bring HCO and continue to make HCO what it is in the future. So super excited there. This is a little quote. I, I say it a lot. I think about it a lot, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about the future in my view of the HD community and where you all can play, where HCO can play, but truly chance of success favors the prepared. And in my mind, it's time for us as the HD community as a whole, I'm not saying none of us are preparing or nobody's preparing, but it's time to prepare. And it's time to prepare because this slide right here, this is a hopeful slide. All the logos on the left are companies, pharmaceutical companies that have a program for Huntington's disease specifically. So the amount of time, money, investment, is is insane in the Huntington's community right now. And I will give a, a shout out to the logos up top, the Roche, Wave, Voyager, Unicare, PTC, Perlenia, Spark. These are all sponsors of the HDO Congress. Uh, I gotta give a shout out. Every company in the Huntington space should be a sponsor of this program. A little disappointing to not see all of these logos up here, but a big shout out to the ones who do. Um, it's gonna take every effort from everybody to, to get to the uh, new, these new treatments. So very thankful for, for a lot of these sponsors that, uh, that, uh, help Congress. So treatments are coming. And my question to all of us is, are we prepared? And, and I break it down into three different categories, quickness, you know, how fast will trials recruit? Um, will the regulators be convinced of this data that the pharma companies are bringing Do regulators and companies understand HD well enough. These are things we need to start thinking about, um, access, you know, great. If, uh, if, a uh, treatment is is approved but you know what countries are going to get it like we need to advocate that you know we're all in the same playing field and it's not just going to be certain countries get these medicines we all deserve them um will your doctor be able to prescribe the medicine you know will it only be available in certain areas in your country um what will the wait times be you know if if there are new treatments are there going to be you know loads of people running to the clinic and you're going to have to wait another six, eight, 12 months? I, I don't know, but questions that, that I have that I hope a lot of people are, are asking. <laughs> and affordability, you know, will, will your insurance pay? Will your government pay? Will you pay? How much? You know, we have a lot of questions that are going to be coming to us in the next couple of years and, and we don't have answers to them now. So um, things I want, you to think about things that somewhat keep me up at night that I'm thinking about, but trying to come up with answers for, for the community. And then my, my slide here is, is really stop. I want everybody to, to, if you're able, stop looking around thinking and hoping someone else is going to get it done for you. Um, I, I don't know who said this. I've heard it before, but essentially like, what can we all do? Look in the mirror and what can we do for this community? 
And I, I want to share quickly just what I'm continuing to do, even though I'm not on the HDO team anymore. Like I'm, as I said, I'm an advocate forever. So where I'm focusing my time and energy is as far as the quickness, um, I'm just writing a, a biweekly column. It's on Huntington's disease news.com on many HD topics. So I would encourage you all just stop by, check it out every other week and comment, have conversations with me about certain topics in the HD community. Um, but trying to bring to light a lot of these issues and, and at least get people to start the conversation. Uh, affordability. Um, I'm work, doing my best to work with pharma companies, regulators to better educate them about HD, but also the needs of HD families. We can't expect that they know what living with HD is like. They, they, most of them don't have HD in their family. It's our job to get out there and share our stories, to share our experiences, to share our needs. And, uh, and lastly, access. Um, I'm working on a new company. It's called HG Gene Co. or HG Genetics Company. And really where it's going to focus is in bringing a better genetic testing process for those at risk in the HD community. Uh, I think it's going to be a huge resource. It's not operating yet. Uh, just putting a lot of time and energy into it. And if you'd like to help me out, I have a survey. You can go to this website, hggeneco.com. Take the survey. It's anonymous. I'm just looking for insights for um, those who are at risk in the United States. Sorry if that disqualifies you, but uh, would love your, your feedback. So when this is brought to life, it's brought to life the right way. So how can you start? How can you help prepare? These are just some ideas. And again, they, they, aren't, uh, they aren't all encompassing, but quickness, join a study, participate in online surveys. Anything you can do to share is great. Um, Jackie, do, we have, do I have to wrap up here? I see you coming back on. No, you're okay for a few more minutes. I'm just right. because you have some questions. All right, I'll speed up. Okay, affordability, uh, get involved. As I've said before, if it's, if it's not your HD association where you live, which there are many in many countries, HDO needs your help. So get involved, but ask questions. Like start pushing the limit and, and asking any dumb question that you think you, you should know the answer to because we need to all get on the same page and access. If appropriate, start becoming familiar with your nearest HD doctor and staff. You know, everyone's situation I know is different where you are with HD, but it doesn't hurt to know where those clinics are, know the doctors, know the staff, know what's going on at those centers. So as I wrap up, really no journey happens without the help of others. This is my truly a shout out slide. Um, I have a lot of people to thank who have got me just in, in life to where I am today. My dad and my sister growing up, uh, my mom's physician, Dr. Martha Nance, she's been an instrumental to me. Uh, the childhood friends who helped grow the Hoopathon, who were out, you know, running around in snow boots, uh, knocking on doors, raising money. Uh, my mentors at, at Lundbeck, who continue to be close to the HD community, Arvind and Dan, uh, many HD community friends, you know, Jackie, I see your face, um, you know, uh, just people who have been introduced to me through HD, but have become true friends. Can't thank you enough. Uh, the Lord, my family, as I mentioned, uh, my son, Jet, who's right here, my wife, Jamie and, and Harlan. Uh, I'll show you a quick video of Jet just to end on a happy note. And then my HDO friends, um, you know, Kat, Martin, if you're out there, uh, you know what I think of you and everything that you brought to HDO and the HD community. Uh, obviously, you guys know Matt's story. Um, Matt and I uh, go way back. Jack Griffin, uh, without Jack, HDO wouldn't be here uh, to the complexities it is. Chandler, for all your seven years of being here. The board members, uh, so many board members in and out uh, over the last 10 years, but everyone's given their time and energy, but just a ton of volunteers too. So I thank you. Um, how can I help you is always my question at the end. Find me, I'm very easily accessible. This is my cell phone. Find me on WhatsApp, text me, call me. LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I hate we have so many ways to communicate. Um, best is my cell and I will respond to you. Um, but I'm going to leave you on one quick note. This is what gives me my, my pride and joy. Hopefully you can hear this, but this is my son Jet uh, with me smacking my daughter uh, with a pillow. And this is what I get to do every day. Can you hear it, Jackie? All right. So we all need a little giggle and I'll, uh, I'll end there, but thank you for your time, everybody. I look forward to connecting with you and learning how I can help in any way, shape, form. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, BJ. As always, you are 
inspirational to my soul and I am forever grateful to know you and have um, learned so much from you over the past. Um, we have one question for you, but um, I'm gonna do a couple, you know, nice things to, to hype you up a little bit. One is there's a hello, Jet. Um, so shout out, Jet. And then um, this says, thank you on behalf, or you and your family have certainly, you know, done extraordinary things. You are an inspirational family. Thank you on behalf of the families I work with. Your support with HDO has been incredible. And it's so cute to hear your baby in the background. Hi, Jet. Um, so BJ, obviously, you know, through everything you talked about, we know that how heavily you've been involved. Um, the question that we have from one of our attendees is, did you ever get volunteer burnout? Um, and if so, how did you um, get through it? Or how did you, you know, prevent it from happening? Yeah, a ton of volunteer burnout. I mean, it, it's not easy to communicate with with folks across the globe. So it was early mornings, 5am on phone calls. Um, but you have to, you have to be able to also just take time away for yourself. You got to know you're a volunteer. You got to know you can't do everything. Um, so step away. Um, but also find enjoyment. Like I just, I just really enjoyed it. Like I made the people who were part of HDO truly part of my life and I enjoyed working with them. Um, whether it was 5 a.m. or midnight or whatever time it was, but um, it's something you got to be aware of. But uh, it's okay. It's a it's a normal feeling and a normal thing that any volunteer will go through. Thank you. I think that's great advice. Um, and lots of people in the chat are agreeing with you. And thank you for that. Um, so, guys, as BJ said, you can find him various ways um, on the screen. And yeah, he'd be happy to help. He's been instrumental in my life and helped me through some things. So I encourage you all to get involved and, you know, ask him how he can help you. So thank you, BJ. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Take care. I look forward to seeing you all the rest of the rest of the weekend. Absolutely. Um, so for our attendees, we have a 15 minute break right now. And then there is going to be um, a panel session about having children in track one and then Nacho sharing his journey with Factor H in South America on track two. So take care and we'll see you in 15. Bye.